Hello there. I'm Kiel Saronin Beatmaker, and welcome to Lounge Ronin. All things, everything. If you're new to the channel, please make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. And on this episode, we're going to discuss Christianity's Great Schism. So without further ado, let's get into it. This article was updated December 22nd, 2023. Written by Aleska Vukovic. East vs. West, the untold story of Christianity's great schism. Christianity is one of the foremost religions in the world. It has a long history, which was often fraught with crisis, struggles, and persecutions. Of course, as the centuries passed, so did religious beliefs, the teachings and the fundamental rules. And in time, Christians began acquiring different points of view about their religion. Because of this, the original Christianity began branching. And after the Great Schism, it split into two separate schools of thought. They shaped the development of the world for centuries that followed. The Great Schism, also known as East-West Schism, or the Schisms, or the Schism of 1054, was a significant event in Christian history that resulted in the split between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western Roman Catholic Church. The Schism had profound religious, cultural, and political implications, shaping the course of Christianity for centuries to come. As Christianity became a dominant religion in medieval and Renaissance Europe, the split caused some significant ripples in society, politics, and the flow of history itself. For many generations after the death of Christ, Christians were persecuted and had to adhere to the faith in secrecy. Only in, 13, only in uh, 313 AD, at the Edict of Milan, was their religion decriminalized and be accepted across the civilized world. In 380 and 380 AD, it became the state religion of the Roman Empire and quickly rose as the foremost European religion. It endured this way for several centuries, but by the time of the Middle Ages, differences between teachings began to emerge all leading up to the Great Schism. Doctrinal differences played a central role in the Great Schism, reflecting long-standing theological disputes and gradually intensified over the centuries. These differences encompass various aspects of Christian doctrine, including theological nuances and ecclesiastical practices. Theological disputes had been brewing for centuries between the Eastern and Western churches. Issues such as the nature of the Holy Spirit, the use of unleavened bread, and the Eucharist, and the authority of the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, were among the key points of contention. Still are now, if you think about it. Here we have Pope Leo, who was a key figure during the Great Schism. While his papacy sent the stage, uh, set the stage for tensions, 
the formal split occurred after his death, marked by mutual excommunications in 1054. Centuries of divided, centuries of divided, of uh, centuries of divide. <laughs> the histories of the Great Schism. One of the most significant doctoral disagreements revolved around the inclusion of the term philoquy in the Nicene Creed. The original Nicene Creed, established at the First Council of Nicaea in 325 and later modified the First Council of Constantinople in 381, affirmed the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father alone. In the West, practically in the Latin-speaking church, the phrase philoquy and the Son was to adhere to the Nicaean Creed. This addition stated that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. However, the Eastern Church, which used the original Nicene Creed, without the philoquy clause, viewed this as an unauthorized modification of a creed established by an immunurical council. The philoquy controversy became a symbol of theological and cultural differences, contributing significantly to the schism. Keep in mind, now, we don't really know what necessarily contributed to this to the schism significantly now the only reason why i'm saying that and kind of pushing back a little bit is that you know we have to keep in mind that a lot of these situations and stories are also told in a manner to kind of obfuscate certain key factors and events so i just want to remind everybody that this is just a light introduction into this schism but for anyone out there who is of the eastern or western church i highly recommend you you do a little deeper dive into the origins of the schism because you know things may not always be as they seem but let's continue the issue of papal authority and the primacy of the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, was a nodal doctrinal point of contention. The Pope claimed a position of supremacy over the entire Christian Church, asserting the authority to make doctrinal decisions and intervene in the affairs of other uh, patriarchs. In contrast, the Eastern Church, practically, uh, particularly the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople emphasized a more consular model of governance. While recognizing the historical importance of Rome, these did not accept the Pope's claim to unilateral authority. This divergence in ecclesiastical governance and authority contributed to the rift. You can see that playing out right now with NATO versus Russia, but that's a whole different conversation. Beyond specific doctoral formulations, there were differences in uh, literal practices and ecclesiastical traditions. The use of different languages in worship services, Latin in the West, Greek in the East, and variations of uh, literal rites contributed to a sense of cultural and religious divergence. Additionally, the Eastern Church had a strong emphasis on mysticism and theosis. mysticism and theosis, the process of becoming one with God, while the Western church, influenced by Latin theology, had its distinctive theological emphases. Which is interesting because if you think about it, Eastern church is more in line with Gnostic um, practices, you know, while you can look at the um, Western church more in line with, how do I put this? a more mainstream theological um, ideology of Christ. Where they have done away with the 
true origins of Christianity and its more controversial practices such as sodomy and trying to obfuscate some of these older occult practices within Christianity. I know this might come as a shock to some people, but you know, um, when you look at the Greek origins of words and as well as the Bible, you begin to realize that Christ was a, a druggie who was practicing um, various forms of sodomy and child trafficking. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about this, I highly recommend you check out the YouTube channel, Lady Babylon. Uh, I'm not gonna get too into the weebs of it right now because I wanna stay on topic, but just something for those out there who want to question certain verses in the Bible, especially when Christ gets arrested for being in a park with a naked boy late at night and 2 a.m. Um, you know, some people may want to misinterpret it in some manners, but if you go directly to the source, it's pretty clear cut and dry. But uh, let's continue. Here we have an image of a uh, doctrinal disagreements played a fundamental role in the origin of the Great Schism, such as the inclusion of the term Philoquy in the Nicene Creed, icon depicting the Emperor Constantine and the Bishop of the First Council of Nicaea, 325, holding the Nicaean Constantinopian uh, Creed of 381. All righty. Heated disagreements within Christianity. Political factors also played a role. The power struggle between the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Pope in Rome, as well as the interference of secular rulers in ecclesiastical affairs, further strained relations. These factors were often intertwined with broader geopolitical developments and power struggles within both the ecclesiastical and secular spheres. In the Eastern Roman Empire, centered in Constantinople, the relationships between the emperor and the patriarch of Constantinople was often characterized by a strong imperial influence over ecclesiastical affairs. Emperors sought to exert uh, control over the church to solidify their authority and maintain political stability. Similarly, in Western Roman Empire, especially as it transitioned into the Holy, Ro Holy Roman Empire, there was a tradition of cooperation between the Pope and secular rulers. The concept of papal supremacy grew with the Pope becoming a spiritual authority and at times a political power broker. The Bishop of Rome, known as the Pope, began asserting claims to universal jurisdiction and supremacy over the entire Christian church. This claim to authority extended beyond the spiritual matters and encompassed political and doctrinal domains. The Pope's efforts to assert authority over other patriarchs, including the Patriarch of Constantinople, led to tensions and resistance from Eastern bishops, who were wary of what they perceived as an encroachment on their traditional autonomy. You can see a little bit that has been playing out in Ukraine as well, but that's a whole other conversation. Quote, if the Roman pontiff, seated in the lofty throne of his glory, wishes to thunder at us, and so to speak, hurl his mandates at us from on high, and if he wishes to judge us and even to rule us and our churches, not by taking counsel with us, but as his own arbitrary pleasure, what kind of brotherhood or even what kind of parenthood can this be? We should be the slaves, not the sons of such a church and the Roman sea would not be the powest mother of sons, but a hard and imperious mistress of slaves." End quote. The iconastic controversy in the eighth and ninth centuries, which involved debates over the use of religious icons, had political ramif ramifications as well. 
while both East and West were affected the resolution of the controversy in the East without significant input from the Pope, heightened suspicious, uh, suspicions in the West about the Eastern Church's independence and self-governance. Adding to the tension was the spread of Christianity into areas such as Eastern Europe and the Balkans, brought questions of ecclesiastical organization and jurisdiction. The competing interests of the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church in missionary activities and the establishment of ecclesiastical structures in newly converted regions created tensions. You can see that being played out right now in real time. Uh, here we have an image, or I should say a drawing. The formal beginning of the Great Schism is said to have taken place in uh, 1054 AD, when Michael uh, Centurius, seen during his uh, enthronement here, and Cathedral Humbert excommunicated each other, each other. That must have been really awkward. Can you imagine what that must have been like? <laughs> you're excommunicated. No, you're excommunicated. <laughs> oh, boy. The Great Schism happens in 1054 AD. The Patriarch of Constantinople, Mikhail, uh, um, Michael uh, Cernurio, uh, Michael Cerulius, and the Papal Legate, Cardinal Hubert, excommunicated each other in what is considered the formal beginning of the schism. This is like a really bad breakup, essentially. This act symbolized the irreparable rupture between the Eastern and Western churches, the exchange of anathems of formal curses between the East and West depended the division, deepened the divisions. The Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church were now officially separate entities. These excommunications were the culmination of a long-standing and multifaceted conflict that threatened to erupt into something far greater. In 1054, Pope Leo sent Papal Legate Cardinal Hubert of Silvia Cadadia to Constantinople with the mission of resolving the ongoing disputes. However, instead of fostering reconciliation, the events took a turn for the worse. During the uh, uh, liturgical service at the Hagia Sophia, Cardinal Hubert placed a bowl of excommunication on the altar. This bull, known as the Bull of Excommunication against Patriarch Marco, uh, Michael Cerulius, contained strong language denouncing the actions and beliefs of the Eastern Church. In response, uh, Patriarch uh, Michael Cerulius issued a counter anathem excommunicating Cardinal Hubert and his associates. This reciprocal exchange of anthems marked the formal separation between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. It sounds like, if you ask me personally, uh, it, it sounds like um, Hubert uh, was sent there on ulterior motives. Sounds like this was meant to happen. Pablo agrees. The mutual excommunications symbolically severed the ecclesiastical ties between East and West. It signified the breach and um, the breach had a, signified the breach had reached a point of no return, and the two churches were now officially in a state of schism. The anthem reflected uh, not only specific accusations but also a deeper doctrinal and cultural divide. The excommunications emphasize irreconcilable differences in theological understandings, uh, liturgical practices, and ecclesiastical governance. Needless to say, this was a point of no return and affected the relationship between the East and West immensely.
the formation of the two churches. The Great Schism led the establishment of the Eastern Orthodox Church, with its center in Constantinople and the Roman Catholic Church centered in Rome. Each developed its distinct traditions, doctrines, and ecclesiastical structures. The Eastern Orthodox Church, emerging from the traditions of the Byzantine Empire, maintained a consular model of the government of governance. The autocephalous nature of the various patriarchs, including Constantinople, Alexandria, Anatoch, and Jerusalem, allowed a degree of independence, with each patriarch having its own local synod. It retained its rich uh, liturgical traditions, heavily influenced by Byzantine rites. The use of the Greek language in worship uh, services became a distinct feature, and the liturgical calendar followed the Eastern Orthodox liturgical year. The Roman Catholic Church centered in Rome maintained a hierarchical structure with the Pope as its apex. The Pope claimed authority over the entire Christian Church, asserting papal supremacy. The centralized authority of the Pope allowed for a more unified governance structure. Latin was the liturgical language of the Roman Catholic Church, distinguishing it from the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, the Latin liturgy, with its rites and traditions, was used in worship services across Eastern Christendom. The schism had lasting effects in the Christian world, contributing to the development of Eastern Orthodoxy and the Roman Catholicism as distinct traditions. It also influenced the course of history, including the Crusades and the relationships between Eastern and Western Europe. Over the centuries, various attempts were, a were, were able to heal the schism, but none resulted in full unity. In recent decades, there have been dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, fostering better understanding and cooperation. Here we have an image at the seat of the Roman Catholic Church and the residence of the Pope, the Vatican, was essential to the events of the Great Schism. Here we have the night view of Ballistica, St. Peter in Rome, Italy. Beautiful. I'll make my way there one day soon. The Great Schism forged an unbridgeable gap. There is no doubt that the schism influenced the geopolitical landscape of medieval Europe and the Byzantine Empire to a great extent. The Eastern Orthodox Church became a deeply rooted in the Byzantine world, while the Roman Catholic Church played a central role in the development of Western Christendom. Many wars erupted between the adherents of the two churches, and the once brotherly nations were irreversibly divided because of their respective churches. Because of the Great Schism, the world saw immense bloodshed and persecution, and Europe was separated in two. In recent decades, there have been dialogues and efforts towards mutual understanding between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. While progress has been made, significant theological and ecclesiastical differences persist. Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy still remain fundamentally different, and to this the different uh, and to this the different Christian denominations, such as uh, such as Protestantism, Restorationism, and many others, and you get a complex religious backdrop which divides the uh, believers who, in principle, adhere to the same faith. Very true. And there you have it. Christianity's great schism. I have to say he does make a, a very good point. They, they all are practicing the same faith. But like I said, I, I'm, I'm very convinced uh, Hubert was uh, put up to this. I think there were much more powerful forces at play that wanted this schism to use it as a way to further um, maintain 
and attain more power and resources throughout the world. Because if you know, both sides of these churches pretty much go on a whole spree of um, conquering lands and, and converting um, lands and, and pillaging resources under the guise of uh, God and faith. So, you know, you have to take take that into consideration. Uh, that's why when I'm looking at this, I'm just like, man, this seems like Hubert was totally told to do the exact opposite of what he was ordered to do. Um, it's uh, it's it's definitely um, interesting, and it almost makes me want to look him up, which I don't know why, but I almost want to look him up. Uh, I guess I, the what I'm trying to say here is um, I just think that there were just much larger forces at play because then, you know, after that, you have this idea of them essentially kind of using this division to attain more power. I mean, in the end, you know, sure, there might be two different churches, but uh, they adhere to the same God and they both adhere to the same donors, um, whoever that may be. Uh, I'm just saying for everyone out there, I just think that um, these are things to uh, take into consideration. Because you have to wonder, why did he go the complete opposite of what he was supposed to do? Why would he do that? Here, real quick, I'll pu I'll pull this up for you guys, cause um, we can uh, just out of curiosity about good old Hubert. I want to know what Hubert was all about. Let's see what they have to say. Alrighty, Hubert. Oh, Humbert. I've been calling him Hubert. It's Humbert. <laughs> Hubert sounds better. <laughs> Alrighty, Humbert of Sylvia Candida, French Cardinal. All right, Humbert of Sylvia Candida, born 1000 Lurian, France, died May 5th, 1061 in Rome was a cardinal papal legate and theologian whose ideas advanced the 11th century ecclesiastical reforms of Pope Leo. Okay, so he was an influencer. He was a Christian influencer. His TikTok probably would have been fire. His doctoral uh, intricacies, however, uh, occasioned the definite... Uh, oh occasioned the definitive schism between the Eastern and Western churches in 1054. A monk of the Benedict, uh, Benedictine Monastery of Mo uh, moyenne Montier in Vosages Mountains, France, from the age of 15, Humbert became expert in Greek and Latin and con uh, concentrated his theological studies on the problem of church-state relations. His friendship with Bruno of Toll and their common zeal in reforming ecclesiastical abuses ended in his being summoned to Rome in 1049 after Bruno's ascension to the papal throne as Leo. Thenceforth, he developed as a major instrument in implementing papal policy during the reigns 
of Leo and his successors, Victor II, Stephen, and Nicholas. Okay, so he was an advisor to the Pope, and his best friend became Pope, and he continued advising. Humbert joined in wide-ranging dispute over the nature of uh, Eurocrats, and in 1050, castigated the Reformed doctrine of Benegir of Tours. In the spring of 1050, Leo named Humbert Archbishop of Sicily and later made him Cardinal. Humbert advocated a uh, uh, monocrial concept of the bishop and centralized authority of the papacy to a denunciation of Latin rite by Michael uh, Curlerilius, Patriarch of Constantinople, he replied in 1053 with the tract Adversus Gracorium Calmunius against the slanders of the Greeks. Pope Leo dispatched Hubert to Constantinople in 1054 to determine the significance of the expression by Emperor uh, Constantine Monomachus of a desire for Greek-Roman reunion. And while there, Humbert engaged uh, leading Byzantine theologians in public disputions. Oh, so so this guy he was a he was a an a, 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 an advisor, an influencer, and and he 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 loved to debate. He loved to debate. He loved to 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 start shit. Okay, <laughs> okay, we're getting somewhere now. Frustrated by the theological stalemate in the discussions with the Greeks, hear that. He was frustrated but with the theological stalemate in the discussions with the Greeks. That should tell you something. That should tell you something. Uh, our, our boy here, um, he, was, he was talking all that smack, uh, but he, he, he couldn't follow through with the punch. Or I should say he couldn't follow through with the finisher. And by their uh, repudiation of his inflexible demands, for submission to the Latin church. Humber, in a formal convocation in the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia, in July 16, 1054, excommunicated Patriarch Michael as a heretic. A general condemnation of the entire Greek Orthodox Church followed. So wait a minute. So because he couldn't win fairly, he decided to just sabotage the entire thing. Oh gosh, what a what a little punk. That's all I gotta say. With the death of Pope Leo in 1054, Humbert returned to Rome and continued as a consultant to Pope Victor. He was made papal chancellor of Liberian of the Roman Church when his friend Frederick of Lyon became Pope. Uh, Steph, uh, Stephen in August 1057, Humbert assisted in drafting the papal election decree dismissing secular influence in church govern- government and affecting the papal alliance of 1059 with the Normans. He also wrote the tract Adversius uh, Sinopnicius against, Simnos- uh, against Simonacius, those who brought spiritual uh, benefices and offices in which he maintained the extreme opinion that the ministerial acts of uh, seminomical or schismatic churchmen were invalid. In order to abolish the rampant abuses of lay investiture, the practice of laymen conferring ecclesiastical offices, he proposed the election of the bishops. He carried out by the people and clergy and had been practiced in early Christianity. So this guy... This guy is essentially a sore loser. He's a sore loser. So Humbert of Sylvia Candida was essentially a sore loser. He was a sore loser. He was a sore loser who couldn't compromise. And he was corrupt. He was all about power. He wanted a, a, a religious monarchy of the church. He was a sore loser. 
he, he was he was a corrupt sore loser. So you know what, like I said to my uh, my my Christian brothers and sisters out there, I, I, just be skeptical of the uh, of your of your your church and the uh, the the celebrities who um, aided in cementing the foundations of your church because uh, Humbert here was a sore loser and it kind of sounds like he was a bit of an asshole. Just something to keep in mind. <laughs> oh, Lord. Like I said, this was a light introduction. But for my, my Christian brothers and sisters out there, please do some more research out there. Um, reach out to your, you know, Eastern Orthodox Church practitioners and priests and vice versa. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to challenge them. And if they are unwilling to be open-minded, then that's something that you guys as individuals should really reflect on and take into consideration as you move forward in your belief system. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Lounge Ronin. All things, everything. If you've made it this far, please, Make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. And until next time, stay positive, stay focused, stay true, and much, much love.